Welcome back to Better Than Before. I'm your host, Tony Richards, and thought I'd talk to you about something today that's very personal to a lot of people, and that is your money. And I want to talk to you a little bit about managing your finances and having a better life and being satisfied uh, in all areas of your life, including your financial area. One of the things that I've always done is I've always hung out with people that I could learn from. And I've hung out with some really successful people. And uh, some of the times when I talk about some of the people that I've been around and I've had conversations with and some of the questions I've asked, it just kind of blows people away. Like, wow, you... You were backstage and had a conversation with Garth Brooks. Yeah, not only was I did I do that, he actually got me and my wife a Coke. <laughs> He's like, can I get you anything? And my wife said, a soft drink would be nice. And he goes and gets her a soft drink. And we had the most wonderful 15 or 20-minute conversation. And because I knew we were going to, you know, I prepared. I, I thought, you know, what am I going to talk to this person about? And I learned a long time ago, when you hang out with really successful people, or if you want to even call them famous, one of the things you have to remember is if you want to build a relationship with them and you want them to be at ease and in comfort, just treat them like people. Don't have stars in your eyes and be all gaga over them and starstruck and all that because that makes them very uncomfortable and they would like to get away from you as soon as possible. But if you just treat them like regular everyday people and that's what they are really they will give you a lot of lessons and so over the years I've read biographies of of people I've had in-person relationships and conversations with people and so I've picked up some lessons from these people that have done really well in life and therefore they've made a lot of money in life and I just asked them what some of the things are that they could pass along as as tips or best practices here's number one and, and I just gleaned this from several entries in my journal. So these are not all the things I've learned from people, but these are just a few. Six or seven things I think might be beneficial to pass along to you. Number one, if you're in business, sales are insanity and profits are sanity. The gross is the gross. I mean, you're going to gross money, but it takes money to make money, so you're going to have expenses. It's what you have left over and what you do with what's left over that's important. It's crazy to increase your top line revenue and not increase your bottom line revenue. If your top line keeps increasing and your bottom line keeps decreasing, you've got a problem. Number two, do not increase your lifestyle costs as you increase your income. Have you ever noticed how many people win the lottery and then you hear 15 years later they're broke and they've lost it all? That happens so many times over and over because people are not equipped to handle that much uh, monetary compensation. They just kind of go crazy with it. They get into what's called hyperconsumption. And hyperconsumption happens when entrepreneurs or lottery winners or whoever start making more money and they sabotage themselves by increasing their lifestyle costs. They'll move into a better neighborhood. They'll buy a bigger house. They'll join the country club. They'll buy three more cars than they normally would need. They'll send their kids to a private school that they never would have done before if they wouldn't have had that money. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy a bigger house. I'm not saying you shouldn't move to a better neighborhood. I'm not saying you shouldn't join the country club. And I'm not saying you shouldn't buy three cars if that's what you want to do. But try to keep your head on your shoulders and think about safety and security financially in the long term. You know, not just scratching that itch short term to have that money burning a hole in your pocket and have to spend it just because you've got it. Number three. Leverage the magic of compounding. This is one that was a very important lesson for me to learn, and I fortunately learned it early on uh, in reverse. You know, people who think interest rates are high now because we went from we went from zero interest for so long after the 07, 08 economic crisis, and now we're up to a couple percent, three percent, four percent, and people think, "Wow, that's expensive." Hey, back in the late mid to late eighties, I saw eighteen, nineteen, almost twenty percent interest, and unfortunately, I wasn't on the collecting side; I was on the borrowed side. And so, when you think about 
how much money you spend extra because you got a 29% credit card or you have a high interest loan. Think about that in reverse. How can you put yourself in a position where you're the one that's earning the high interest rather than paying the high interest? And a lot of times, Bill and I have talked about on the show before, that can happen with dividends. That can happen. You're not going to get a lot of money on interest-bearing accounts today. But, hey, interest rates are on the rise. So try to figure out what's the best way to compound your money, not compound your expenses, right? Number four, set up the funds of wealth. So a really smart person told me that, A, you need to have 24 months of money on on the side that's two years of cash in case of emergency so if you become unemployed you become uh in a place where you lose your job you can't work something crazy happens uh maybe your health insurance stops covering you you come down with the illness you need to make sure you've got cash in reserve and have that emergency fund as a goal with 24 months of cash in it number two is the growth fund This is where you put your money to take a little risk and invest some money in your growth fund. I like what Kevin O'Leary on Shark Tank says. He says, I send my my dollars out marching like little soldiers, and I expect them to come marching back with other little soldiers. Like, go out, capture the other dollars, and bring those dollars back. The Adventure Fund. This is an interesting one. The Adventure Fund. Every month, deposit at the end of the year you go someplace or you do something fun money is meant to be turned into goods services and fun and so you will not be a happy person if you don't spend some money and have a little fun your mind will start saying what are you doing all this work for we work 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 we never have any fun so maybe you get an account that you call the adventure fund and you peel off a little bit of your paycheck every uh, week or every month, whatever you think you can afford. You put it in there and at the end of the year, you take it out and you do something. Uh, You spend it. And then finally, you want to put together at least two more bank accounts that you can deposit some money in that mean something special to you. Those can be savings funds for your kids, uh, for college, or for when you want to give it to them on their wedding day, or uh, it could be for nieces or nephews or grandkids or whatever, but two extra bank accounts where you can just put a little money in every now and then that over time will build up uh, and you're going to like give that to somebody or do some, make a donation to a charity or to a special cause or to a uh, Heart Association, Cancer Society, or a nonprofit organization. Whatever's meaningful to you and makes you feel like you're contributing to a church or an organiza- spiritual organization, I don't know what it would be. You know what it would be. You, you put that together. So emergency fund, growth fund, adventure fund, and two funds uh, that are kind of meaningful for you that you can put some money in, that you can do uh, some donating. And so those are the five funds of wealth. Number five, understand the danger of debt. I have learned the danger of personal debt and probably learned it the hard way because I have clawed myself out to being debt free twice in my life. And the first time I did it, I felt so free and so wonderful that you would have thought that I wouldn't have done it the second time. But I got a little bit behind in the economic uh, recession of 07, 08, and I had to dig into my credit cards a little bit. But I have successfully uh, climbed back out of that again. And I am very cognizant of, of going into personal debt where you don't have uh, very much money, let's say, and you're, you're buying a new car because you can finance it. Now, there isn't anything wrong with financing a car, but I know some people are just like they're financed or they are uh, leveraged down to the penny. And you've just got to be careful about that. Let's say you're not used to having money and you're not used to having things. And all of a sudden that puts you in pain because you're like, well, I deserve to have a car just like everybody else, or I deserve to be able to do that like everybody else. And then 
uh, debt becomes a pain reliever. So it comes along and soothes your pain because it allows you to buy that thing now instead of waiting until you have the money. And then all of a sudden you're paying for several years and you're paying not only what the price of the thing costs, you're paying interest on top of it and you will have paid for it two or three times by the time you get to the end. I mean, hey, you got to have Christmas and that's all good, but be cognizant of putting too much of your Christmas on credit card because when that statement comes in January, that can be a different kind of pain. Number six is, and this sounds like preaching and I don't mean for it to, to sound like preaching, but number six is live within your means and invest your savings. Comes down to implementation and execution as most things do. When you're worth a billion dollars, yes, you can fly private on your own jet. You can afford it. I can't afford a private jet. I wish I could. I do a lot of travel, and that would come in handy, probably give me a couple of extra days back if I could go on a private jet every time I have to go somewhere. Be careful of envy. Live within what you can do. Be happy. Figure out a way to keep some of it in for a nest egg for retirement, and that will serve you well. And then finally, number seven, don't just grow your money, protect your money. And so you need to check into trusts and uh, some things like that that can be some protection mechanisms for you, especially if you own land or property, especially if you have a family that has some holdings, farms and things like that. And I have an excellent attorney uh, that I want to have on who talks about family and legacy. And she only works mainly with people who have family farms and how to protect those as mom and dad and grandpa and grandma get older and they want to keep those holdings in the family and keep those uh, inheritance taxes down. But even more than that, keeping uh, outside parties from taking over that uh, land that have been in the family for years. So don't just grow your money, protect your money. If you're working hard for it and you've, you've been disciplined enough to put it away, you need to make sure to get the mechanisms in place to protect it. So great show this week. Thanks for listening. Until we talk to you next week, everything gets better when you get better. Thank you for listening to Better Than Before with Tony Richards, a business leaders podcast powered by Clear Vision Development Group. For more resources from Tony, visit clearvisiondevelopment.com. Join us next time for another episode of Better Than Before with Tony Richards. Yeah.